Hello, I'm Lizzie Kaplan. Uh, and this is the story of Ruth Ann Thompson, as written by Lindsay Beer. Before we begin, I do want you to know that this story has some graphic images associated with it, and that Ruth Ann is here with us tonight. Hi. <laughs> The Motion Picture and Television Fund helps those in our community when we are at our lowest and most vulnerable navigate crises so that we don't have to do it alone. We all hope the worst never happens, but if it does, we can only hope to be lucky enough to come out the other side okay. When the worst happened to me, MPTF was there to help me through it. At a time when I felt helpless and alone, they made me feel surrounded by a community ready to help. They made me feel lucky. My time was a year ago. My name is Ruth Ann Thompson, and this is my story. I am alone. Minutes ago, I was surrounded by friends at a Karate Kid-themed birthday party, yes, for grown-ups. <laughs> These are my people. Theme parties, nerd fests, I'm all in. If you couldn't tell by my favorite 80s denim jacket that I'm wearing, covered in themed pins and patches that I've been collecting for 10 years. Now I'm stopping for gas near my one bedroom apartment in Koreatown. It's no palace, but it's home. The kind I can afford as an extra, a sometimes working actress, doing the classic LA hustle. One day I'm on set with Nicole Kidman, the next I'm a princess at a kid's birthday party. I have a podcast with my best friend. I'm a geek, doing what I love, working paycheck to paycheck, project to project, character to character, which I am myself kind of a character, people say. Christ, this tank is taking forever to fill. I'm only putting in 20 bucks. I'm aware of my surroundings, the way you have to be as a woman at night, even when it's not that late, which it isn't, it's 9.30. Even when the station is well lit, which it is, my head is on a swivel. I make sure to use the stall closest to the attendant, but there's no one else here and I have a strange feeling. I'm relieved when the meter hits 20 and I put the pump away. And still, he takes me by surprise. I feel him pressed up on me before I hear him. I hear him before I see him. I see him before his gun. I think it's fake. Blame it on one too many acting gigs. I can smell his sweat even through the gasoline. He demands my keys. I scoff and tell him no. My car's a piece of shit, but it's all I have. I try to turn away, and that's when I feel a brutal crack on my head, then a blow to the other side, pistol whipped. The gun is not fake. He wants my purse, my money. But I'm a fighter. I fight back. Adrenaline kicks in. I throw a punch to his face and inflict my own crack, breaking his glasses. I've scared him off, and through blurred, bleary eyes, I barely see him run away. I can't see. I drop to the ground, trembling, clumsy hands searching for my glasses. I find his first, and then my own. I get in my car. I don't know what to do. What the hell do I do? Someone attacked me. Report it. I try to call 911 and can't. I'm not just shaking. He hit me so hard that I can't move my hand. I dial with the other, but I can't hear out of my right ear. He's ruptured my eardrum. My ear is ringing. I feel warmth, and not just the flush from the rush. That's when I see it. The blood. I am gushing blood down my face all over that favorite jacket. I'm on hold forever, alone forever. A mere 45 seconds, I realize later. An eternity of panic. The blood keeps pouring. I'm terrified I will pass out before someone finds me. I check that my attacker is gone, stumble out of the car, and to the gas station attendant. I ask if I can wait inside until 911 answers my call, but she takes one look at my bleeding head and tells me to get out and stay outside. I am alone. I get back in my car, finally connect, and that voice on the other end of the line is a lifeline. They're sending help. I fight to stay conscious. I've never been more alone. The police come before the ambulance. A female officer. I don't know what I'm saying. 
a blur of questions, a blur of ringing. I can't hear out of my right ear. I don't know, I don't know, I describe him. They tell me he will most likely strike again and that's when they will catch him. They never do. The officer asks if I have someone that I can call. Lucky for me, I do. I call Chris. Her sweet voice answers and I feel so guilty for how I'm about to ruin her night. I tell her what happened. At least, I think I do. My voice is shaking and I'm not making sense. My hands are shaking too. I can't stop shaking. Why can't I stop shaking? I'm at the hospital. The fluorescent lights, the sterile scent of antiseptic, more questions, tests, an MRI. They shave my head, staple my wounds, staple, 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 four more assaults to my head, but that doesn't stop the bleeding. And then two more, staple, staple, it's worse than it looks on TV. A nurse is kind, and his kindness is everything. So are these drugs that they gave me for the pain. I'm feeling better now, calmer now, safer now, sedated. They let Chris into my room. She's warm, caring, and this too calms me. She holds my bloody hand as she comforts me. She shows me the staples, tries to reassure me it's not so bad. She brings me fresh clothes. I have nerve damage, but the MRI shows no sign of hemorrhage. I'm lucky, they say, and I know it. Don't I know it? I'm cleared to go home, but I'm afraid to be alone. I go home with Chris that night. She wants me to eat a little something. And that's when I realize that I can't open my jaw or chew. She makes me a bed, safe, soft, and warm, but sleep does not come. I lie there staring at the ceiling and replaying the night's horrors. You're lucky, crack. His gun whips my head, crack. Blood drips down my face. How could I be so stupid? Why did I fight back? Why didn't I just give him what he wanted? The coward with a gun. The pain throbs like memories as I relive the attack over and over, thinking about what could have happened. The morning brings fresh fears. I don't have insurance, I tell Chris. I had just found out that an auto payment hadn't cleared my checking and it lapsed. The ambulance ride, the hospital stay, thousands already and more to come. The bills crack, the attack crack, my ear crack, rent crack. I don't know what to do. What the hell do I do? I can't work, I can't hear. I can barely open my mouth to eat. Chris is amazing, but we cannot do this alone. So she connects me with Jen Clymer, who had joined us for the celebrations just the day before. Jen works with the Motion Picture and Television Fund, MPTF. Jen tells her boss about me, asks if they can help, and her boss tells her, that's kind of what we do. Chris had set up a GoFundMe to help with the medical expenses and rent. It got some views, but then MPTF shares the story and everything changes. It goes viral. Outreach and donations pour in. People I haven't talked to in 20 years. People I've never spoken to. MPTF gave me people all over the world wanting to help. I'll be able to pay for the hospital, my rent. It fills me with tears, but a different kind. The gas station attendant turning me away, bloody and confused, had made me feel more alone than I had ever felt in my life. But now, here was MPTF showing me the world would not turn their backs on me. And that's not all they do, not even close. Jen refers me to MPTF social workers and an MPTF insurance agent, Jennifer Louisel. Their jobs are to help people like me through things like this. Jennifer walks me through how to get new coverage, which plans to consider. It's complicated, but she will help me through each step. She is steady, educated. Her expertise is crucial more hot tears of relief as one less fear courses through. I talk to MPTF social workers. They're calm, no nonsense, an antidote to my anxiousness. I tell them what happened, they listen. They understand, they really understand. They refer me to organizations who can help me move if I want. My apartment is so close to the attack, to the gas station, to gasoline, just the thought of the smell makes me want to vomit. Give me your keys, crack, his face, crack, his gun, crack. 
I replay the events, imagining a different outcome. I give him my keys, my purse. He walks away. The attack never happens. MPTF tells me reliving this is normal. Feeling guilty is normal. Feeling culpable is normal. Feeling terrified that I'll never fully hear again is normal. They assure me that everything I am feeling is normal. And that knowledge is a priceless gift. They refer me to therapists who specialize in trauma and PTSD. It is a turning point, a realization that I can handle this and others like MPTF will help me. And they do, over and over. I still can't hear out of my right ear and I'm terrified it's permanent. The doctors can't tell me otherwise. My life as I know it might be over. No one can tell me otherwise. I look in the mirror, my shaved head, the staples, I barely recognize myself. I lost too much blood to bruise, but I feel a different hangover. Too many fears cycle over and over. Chris shows me my jacket. She cleaned the blood off every pin. It took her hours. I lost so much that day and she would not let me lose this. But I'm a bigger job to fix. I can't stop vomiting, another product of the nerve damage, but I can't see a doctor without insurance. Enter MPTF again to the rescue. They call the doctor, the insurance company, and get me seen. MPTF calls me again and again just to check in. They tell me I'm not a victim, I am a survivor. But I wonder how much of me survived. I take the information MPTF gives me, I have what I need to start healing, rebuilding, but I wonder if I'll ever be me again. I decide not to move. I leave Chris's place and go back to my apartment. My mom stays with me, then my dad. With family and friends, I face each day, over and over, till I'm no longer afraid to be alone. Months pass. They're a blur of pain and doctors and appointments, memories, emotions that feel out of my control, sadness over the trauma and the loss. I hear MPTF's voice in my head, this is normal. The counsel that I have been given helps me feel so much less alone. So I pretend I'm okay, or I try to. It's the hardest role I've ever played. I have episodes, triggers. I pass a gun magazine and look obsessively through each page, trying to prove the gun that I was held up with doesn't exist. I don't want it to be real. But this is normal. This is normal. This is normal. I think of the assault, but also the woman I was before it, the geek, the actress. I want to be her again. I miss the hustle. I miss the hustler, the characters, the character. I am a fighter, a survivor fighting back to myself. In my heart, I forgive the man who attacked me. His life must be hard. He was doing what he thought he had to do. But I don't know if I can forgive myself for what I could have put my friends and family through had they received a different call, had I not been lucky. The officer who responded to my attack finds me at the victim services agency that MPTF helped connect me with. She tells me she is off duty. She just wanted to come shake my hand. She thanks me for my bravery and tells me that while they may not have found him, that fighting back might have scared him from attacking somebody else. It's another turning point. Closure to forgive myself. Recovering from trauma is a process, physically, emotionally, mentally. I almost don't know when it happens, gradually and all at once. I start working again, living again reclaiming senses and confidence, pieces of me, activities. Life isn't what it was, but it finds its rhythm, a new normal. It's almost a year later. I still have nerve damage, hearing damage. Some days the migraines are so bad I lie on the floor immobile from pain. The bills still come and I fight them. Fears still come and I fight them, fighting. That's my theme now. I know how now. Through the help of so many people, so many names, Chris, Jen, Jennifer, MPTF, my family, friends, colleagues, and the strangers that MPTF brought into my life, these are my people. 
and my own name, me, Ruth Ann Marie Thompson. I am finally her again. I am not alone. I am not alone. I am not alone. Ruth Ann, she is a survivor and she is here with us tonight. So please, please give her a hand. She just flew in from London from Comic-Con. So to help her with her jet lag and thank her for sharing her story, the Waldorf Astoria has donated two Diamond Day certificates for you and Chris. So please enjoy.